Ah, welcome, uh, welcome back. We've got a number of uh, questions. We, we thought we'd uh, handle the Saskatoon first because we understand how cold it is out, uh, out west. Um, and Brian, I'm going to send this over to you. Uh, can internal audit play a role in assessing external audit performance, uh, bringing value, auditing our risk, et cetera, including the external audit plan? I think the, uh, the answer is that absolutely. Um, internal audit at a number of organizations is well established, very competent folks can, uh, are in those roles. Uh, they can clearly play a, play a role. They understand uh, audit. They understand how the process should work. Most of them have probably come out of audit recently. So I, I absolutely would encourage um, this. And, and really, when you get into this in terms of your uh, annual um, assessment or your com mandatory comprehensive review every couple of, or every five years, I think internal audit can play a key role in, in uh, working uh, through those uh, types of reviews. Uh, Jim, uh, well, it's cold here in Toronto, too. So, Jim, uh, do you think uh, EBITDA should be a mandatory disclosure in a separate statement or in the notes to financial statements, especially for companies that require or rely on public debt or bank debt? Uh, my, uh, my answer is an emphatic no. Um, and let me explain the reason. EBITDA can be useful, but it can also be misunderstood and, uh, and uh, it's often used as a proxy for cash flow. Uh, but we have a statement for cash flow. And, uh, and so uh, the de problems with EBITDA is that it ignores investment in working capital and that whole dimension. So you can generate a positive EBITDA with absolutely no cash flow. And, uh, and so therefore, uh, I think that the, the real issue here, though, is understanding not only profitability, as uh, Cameron has pointed out, and Don, I think you pointed out, in terms of the impact on the profit state, but understanding cash flow, and particularly understanding free cash flow. I think free cash flow is a critically important measure uh, in terms of looking at operating cash, uh, less dividends, and less capex expenditures. And so, uh, so understanding free cash flow um, is an understanding operating cash flow. I think, Don, is really important. Um, I worry about an over-reliance on EBITDA because of its simplicity uh, and, not and not getting behind the, the dynamics. Uh, and if you, don't under if you don't relate EBITDA to enterprise value, uh, which was its orig origins kind of thing, then, uh, then I think it could be misleading. Okay, here's, uh, here's a question from uh, Montreal uh, on IFRS. Uh, what is the status of IFRS adoption by the uh, by the U.S. and uh, doesn't the fact that U.S. GAAP still prevails diminish the significance of IFRS? So really, what this question is getting at is where is the SEC on on IFRS adoption? Uh, let me just be very clear that the SEC and the U.S. are very engaged in IFRS. They have 500 companies as of as of now that are filing IFRS statements. We Canadians are the largest supplier of IFRS financial filings to them. So they, they are engaged. They have to be engaged in the topic because of the amount. Now, for domestic issuers, that's really the question that they're getting at. What would, what, when would, could domestic issuers make use of IFRS, or when would that be mandatory? Well, the latest thing that's being kicked around down there is could there be some sort of optionality, a, a secondary amount of disclosure in addition to the U.S. gap? Could there be an optional filing with some IFRS information? Would that be a good next step? So that's something that they've said publicly that they're thinking about as, as, as a possibility. Um, you know, I, I, I don't, I, there's a lot of criticism about the fact that they're not moving fast enough. I'm more of a you know, glass half full kind of guy, I guess. I look at the fact that the IESB in international standard setting has been in existence for 10 years. That's not that significant or that long of an amount of time if you think about the length of time our global economy has been functioning. And a lot of progress has been made in 10 years in terms of converging these two sets of standards. So I would say, look, let's not come to a conclusion on uh, a single set not being in effect right now. I want to see where this is at in 20 years from now, 25 years from now. I think we'll be in a, a much stronger position, but until then, it's important that convergence continues to happen because in Canada, we have two major sets of accounting standards in our capital markets. So stay, uh, stay tuned. Uh, here is uh, Winnipeg. Uh, Patricia, I'm going to send this to you, a, a governance question. With the ongoing responsibility and, and lots of work of audit committees, should boards consider establishing a risk or an IT committee? Uh, from a personal point of view, obviously we know in the market that banks and now insurance companies do have you know, strong uh, audit and risk committee. 
I guess uh, what you see in the market, there's more and more risk involved uh, that are, you know, attracting uh, more attention. And I think even for smaller entities, it, it would be worthwhile just to start with a small group that is uh, identified as a risk group. And depending with the size of the company as it grows, whether they risk, whether they should be a separate entity or should they, you know, report into uh, the audit. I think it depends on the size and the scope going forward. But I think for a medium size, I think it's worthwhile to start looking at a, a risk committee. With regards to the IT committee, I don't think there's a need to have a separate board IT committee because the scope of looking at IT is so is so huge. But I think you know there should be a definite segment of uh, the discussion at the board with regards to looking at the major projects, delivering on time, on budget, and what are the impacts on the strategy of the uh, of the companies as a whole. Because more and more is strategy, you need to define not just your business strategy, but how you're going to implement and that take care of IT implementation uh, type of projects. Now this is the, the fast close drill. We're going to, I'm going to go around to each of you. One key takeaway that you would, you would give to, uh, to uh, audit committees for year end. And I'm going to start with you, Jim. One key message for the audit committee. I think it's the accounting estimates. Uh, which includes uh, impairment assessments, uh, fair value assessments, uh, that piece, um, and how do you deal with the impact of uh, the uh, highly uncertain environment in which we live. Okay, Cameron? Disclosures. I would say focus on those material items and provide good insights as to why those items are in the financial statements. Provide insights from management's perspective, not just information, but insights. And I think if we do more of that, we will develop the financial statements into more of a communications document for investors uh, and, and, and not as much of a compliance exercise. Patricia? I'd say look at the risk registry that uh, the management is bringing to you and don't be shy to look at the external events that is touching different entities and try and make sure that these uh, questions are being asked by management and not just stick to a cookie cutter risk registry that has been done in the past and they continue to prevail. And Brian? You've got an opportunity to have a robust discussion with the auditors, management, uh, and the audit committee around audit quality. Uh, we've provided some insights and greater transparency to CPAP findings. I would just encourage you to take that public report. Uh, there's a list of questions in there to ask your auditor. Uh, the more robust the discussion around audit quality is as you sign off on these financial statements, challenge your auditors, challenge your management, I think it'll make for an enhanced uh, uh, package around your audit and your financial statements, I would encourage you to have a robust discussion.